We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees, meeting for the first time, raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then in 1909, they raised the second question and discuss it, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? If they answer that question as follows, we must control the State Department. And, the, uh, and then that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying, we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then, Time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914, when World War I broke out. And they arrive at that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. And they realize that that's a pretty big task. So it's, to them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education, which is, could be considered domestic, be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion, which is international, should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat. So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. And, if, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber, will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. So under that condition, Eventually, they assemble 20, and they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London, and there they're briefed into what is expected of them when, as and if, they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. <laughs> 
And um, that new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume book study the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. That's the story that ultimately grew out of and, of course, was what could have been presented by the members of this Congressional Committee to the Congress as a whole for just exactly what it said. The Republican National Committee got wind of, uh, of what I was doing and they did everything they could to stop me. They appealed to counsel to stop me and finally they resorted to the White House. Well, their objection was, as they put it, uh, my devotion to what they call anti-Semitism. That was a cooked up idea, but in, in other words, it wasn't true at all. But anyway, that's the way I expressed it. And, um, Excuse me, why and did they, they made it stick. Why did they do that? How could they say that? Well, they could say, they, they could say it, Mr. Griffin, but, but they had to have something in the way of a have a rationalization of their decision to do everything they could to stop the, stop the completion of this investigation in the direction that it was moving, which would have been an exposure of this Carnegie Endowment story and the Ford Foundation and the Guggenheim and the Rockefeller Foundation, all working in harmony toward the control of education in the United States. But why were the hearings finally terminated? What happened to the committee? The hearings were terminated. Carol Reese was up against such a furor as Hayes through, through the activity of our own counsel. Hayes became convinced that he was being double-crossed. And he put on a show in a public hearing room, Mr. Griffin, that was an absolute disgrace. And he called Carol Reese publicly every name in the book. And Mr. Reese took this as proof that he couldn't, couldn't continue the hearings. Um, he actually uh, invited me to accompany him. When he went down to Hayes' office and in my presence, with the tears rolling down his face, Hayes apologized to Carol Reese for every done and his conduct, and um, apologized to me. And I thought that would be enough, and Carol would resume. But he never did. The charge of, of uh, anti-Semitism is kind of intriguing to me. What what was the basis of that charge? basis that the Republican National Committee used was that the intelligence officer I'd taken on my staff was known to have a book and the book was deemed to be anti-Semitic. This was childish but this was the second in command of the Republican National Committee and he told me that I'd have to I would have to dismiss this person from my staff. Who was that person? Colonel Lee Lorraine. Lee Lorraine. Yeah. And what was his book, do you recall? The, oh, he, book? He'd, uh, the book they referred to was called Waters Flowing Eastward, which was a, uh, a very castigation of the Jewish influence in the world.
How would you describe the, uh, the motivation of the people who created the foundations, the big foundations in the very beginning? What is or what was their motivation? Their motivation, well, let's take, let's take Mr. Carnegie as, uh, as an example. His publicly declared and steadfast interest was to counteract the, the uh, departure of, this, of the colonies from Great Britain. He was devoted to just putting the pieces back together again. The Foundation's allegiance to, uh, to uh, these un-American concepts are all traceable to the type of, to the transfer of the funds over and into the hands of trustees, Mr. Griffin. It, um, not the men who had a hand in, in the creation of the wealth that led to the endowment of, or as a use of that wealth for what we would call public purposes. It was a subversion of the original intent then. Oh yeah, completely so. How do you see that the purpose and direction of the major foundations has changed over the years to the present. What is it today? Oh, 100% behind uh, meeting the cost of education such as, such as it is uh, presented through the schools and colleges of the United States on the subject of our history has proven our, ide our original ideas to be no longer practical. The future belongs to a collectivistic concept, and uh, there's just no no uh, disagreement on this. Why do the foundations generously support uh, communist causes in the United States? Well, because to them, what communism represents a, a means of developing. A, what we call a monopoly. That is the organization, we'll say, of, of large-scale industry into an, an administrable unit. Do they think that they will be one of they the administrators? Will be, they will be the beneficiaries of it, yes.